Hi, this is Jim Conner. Welcome back to another segment. I'm with Romero Rodriguez of Buscapé here in Sao Paulo. We're here at the Conference Annuals do Brasil, uh, meeting a number of investors and a number of angels. You have a very interesting background. You're an entrepreneur, had a company for 11 years, built that company with a lot of hard work, a lot of risk, and eventually sold it. And now you're starting to turn around and be an investor. But let's briefly um, go back. What was the history? Uh, what was your experience like building this company? Okay, sure. Well, I started the company with three friends in 1998, and um, the company um, is a shopping search, a vertical search to help people find the best products and prices. And uh, we basically were able to raise some rounds of financing before the bubble burst in 2000, and uh, it made us survive until break even, which only happened in end of 2002. And, um, and then since we reached break-even, we decided to expand to the whole e-commerce cycle, providing solutions for merchants to uh, attract consumers and sell to consumers. Yeah. So we don't do first party, but we have several different business ranging from payments to classifieds to affiliate networks to uh, group buying solutions, so on and so forth. Yeah, no, that's a pretty broad uh, area of applications. It's one thing to list the product for the retailer, take the order, now you're going to settle the payment. That's a big step. Your company wrote that application itself, right? Yes, yes. So we, um, we used to have, when, um, when Naspers acquired the company in 2009, we used to have about 500 people, and uh, two-thirds of that were engineers. So all the technology was always developed uh, in-house. And the Brazilian payment system supported that, that, that uh, approach, or did you just use a universal uh, you built your own, I bet. I no, we, we ended up building, uh, building our own uh, payment tool, connecting to the banks, uh, especially to find a solution for uh, the local retailers. It's very interesting, but the, 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 the retail in Brazil, it's, uh, it counts heavily on installments. So you usually buy one product for $1,000, but you pay in 10 installments of $100. So you need to handle a lot of different things when you think about payments. They're very local, so we ended up having to to develop it ourselves. And um, when did the customer take possession of the product? At the beginning or after halfway through the payments or at the end? That's very interesting. Uh, we, we also realized that the tiny merchants were afraid of selling online because they were afraid of chargeback frauds. And consumers were afraid of buying from unknown small sellers. So we set up an escrow system. So when you buy, we would keep the money until you receive the goods, and then we would release the money to the seller. Uh, and this helped a lot to enable sales on tiny, tiny merchants, um, which, which we believe it's, it's very good for the market itself. Quite remarkable, very innovative. And, and, and is it mainly in Brazil or all through South America? No, it's mainly in Brazil. We do have operations in South America, um, pretty much every single market, but uh, mostly for the search business, the vertical search business. After you broke even, did you need more funding? Uh, yes, we did. One, only once. In fact, we, we reached break-even. We raised, uh, pre-break-even, we raised uh, $3 million. When we reached break-even, we still had 50% of that money. But uh, by 2006, we decided to merge uh, with our largest competitor in Brazil. And a big portion of the payment was in cash and a little bit in, in equity. So we had to raise more money for that acquisition. But these were the two, uh, the two moments we had to raise money at all. That's great. That gives yeah. you a great deal of independence also yes. and, and choice. Uh, so the exit comes along. And uh, was it a multiple bidder process or one company came and said, we must have you? This was very interesting. Um, we, were, we were following a path for a, a potential IPO in 2012 or something. And then by 2008, Naspers approached us and they were willing to acquire the company. Uh, at the time, uh, the shareholders of the company were the founders in uh, Great Hill Partners, a venture capital uh, firm from the US. And we decided to run a formal process. We invited several players, all the continents, uh, but we ended up not closing with anyone. Uh, the process was taking too long and management was too distractive. And yeah, I think it was good because right after we put on hold, uh, the Lehman Brothers thing happened uh, in September 2008. Mm -hmm. So we ended up not finishing the process, but by early 2009, first, second quarter of 2009, Naspers called back and said, well, I heard 
you are not in the process. We don't like competitive process. So if you're still willing to, to talk to us, we'd be glad to put a number on the table. And then we ended up finishing um, the transaction in September 2009. Wow. September 2009, yeah. so about a year, roughly. About a year, yeah. yeah. That was a South Af African firm, correct? Exactly, NASPERS. Now, that must have been a, um, the due diligence process must have been extensive, I would assume. Can you speak to that? I, was it surprising, first of all, and was it as extensive as I'm suggesting? No, it was. It, it, it always, they, they, they are always <laughs> extensive. I think we were lucky at some point for, for having Merrill Lynch and Unibanco as shareholders when the company was super tiny. So the level of governance and compliance they made us put in the company was ridiculous for the size of the business, but it was good because we started on the right foot. Yep. Uh, so I have to say in, in, in like for the legal due diligence and accounting due diligence, pretty much everything was ready. Uh, I think the business due diligence was the deeper one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's really a stumbling block that when a company gets an inquiry or a serious uh, reach a t contact, they're not ready at all for the requ request for documentation or even the uh, research and the due diligence on their processes. So it's a, usually a big step yeah. backwards for many companies. Or they falter. They simply falter trying to catch up. So, so the um, sale goes through 2009. Now it's now it's uh, you're running the division, correct? And exactly. You become, and so that's another obligation, which is also very serious. You have to make a cultural shift. I assume your values to the corporate buyer's values. Then now you're part of the the big company. And what was that like for you? Oh, it's never easy. It was a big change for me. I, I, I took as a, as a personal challenge. Uh, so I was offered the position to become a CEO for this global division of comparison shopping. Uh, suddenly, uh, the Latin American business starts to, to account only for 50% of the total revenues. And I was responsible for another 18 markets, including East Europe, Africa, Italy, um, Nigeria, so on and so forth. So I think was, on a personal perspective, was, uh, and it has been very challenging. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something different. I'm, I'm, I'm in this position for one year and a half right now and enjoying. So that's exactly. wonderful. So far, uh, until it's fun, I'm there. Yeah, and as long as it's fun, you have a good time and you're learning something, that's great. Um, so back to Brazil now. The okay. entrepreneur world is just bubbling up here, yeah. taking off. What is your your interpretation of the it's a it's a it's a permanent move it's not just a definitely fashion. no definitely definitely I, I think we have all the right ingredients to see uh, this uh, going on and on and on and on um, and, and I think a big proof of that is having such a market like this that we are presenting right now in a such a, a such a terrible uh, macroeconomic moment for Brazil so it really shows that uh, the early stage, the digital space is very mature because it's already, we, we start to see no correlation between macroeconomics and the early stage in startup uh, scene. Um, so I think uh, the ingredients are first, we have all the pieces of the platform together for the first time. So very early on, we had entrepreneurs, but no money. Then we had money, but no entrepreneurs, so on and so forth, in different kind of money and entrepreneurs. Now we have uh, uh, very mature entrepreneurs. We have angel investors to take them to uh, the early stage, the seed round. We have early stage VCs, growth VCs. Um, so entrepreneurs are good until Series A, Series B. Uh, one year ago, two years ago, everybody was asking, what about the, the big Series Bs or the Series Cs? They are coming, lots of interesting companies doing follow-ons, very interesting follow-ons, bringing money from uh, well-established uh, American VCs, even some American VCs opening operations here, like yeah. Redpoint, for, yeah. for example. So, um, so I think for the first time, we have uh, the complete ecosystem, yeah. uh, as I mentioned. And, um, and maybe the government starting to also participate. Yes, yes. You have a uh, Startup Brazil, for example. Yeah. Uh, it's true that uh, more could be done, of course, especially in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, but I think it's, it's a good progress. Most, most from the private scene than the public scene, but I think the public scene is also moving in the right direction. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. Yeah, the, uh, um, you know, we have a lot of angel investors at the conference here, you, many people, and uh, everybody's concerned about the taxes, the regulations, will they have, what, what happens on an exit? Well, 
we kind of worry about that when we get there. But no, the policies and so on. So I think it's great to see the government uh, participating in the conference and being here and being visible. Too, yeah. And listening and, and going back and doing something. So do you have any sense, any, uh, what do you feel will happen maybe in the next one to two years? Do you think be more, will there be an IPO, large IPOs, or will we continue? Nothing wrong with lots of entrepreneur startups and uh, lots of value created. That's that's a very interesting question, and uh, um, to be quite honest, I don't know. I, I was here. I was invited here to come and talk about exits, because we were on the one of the few exits that uh, the digital space saw in Brazil, uh, and and I think the the economic crisis will probably postpone some exits, but at the same time, it creates a lot of opportunity for the underdogs who are trying to disrupt the big incumbents because every time you have economic crisis you have behavior shift and that's when people start thinking can i do this in a more efficient way cheaper way so probably there is an app for that so so in that sense uh, one thing i know we do have a 30 35 percent penetration of smartphones very expensive data plans uh this number will not come back and in two years' time, it's going to be probably 60%. And this movement of going to zero smartphone presentation penetration to 100 smartphone penetration, it's going to happen only once in lifetime. Yeah. And it's going to be in the next two, three years. I so I think it's going to be very exciting yeah. because uh, uh, I think every, every single company in any sector today could be disrupted by an app in some point in the future. So everybody should be very alerted. There's nowhere to hide. No, <laughs> not anymore. Not with this technology. If you're hiding and you think you've got a, a protected monopoly or something, not necessarily true. That's great. Uh, Romero, I want to thank you so much. It's been delightful to talk to you, and uh, we look forward to uh, following your career, frankly, and hearing what other great things may come down the pike for you, and as well as the investors of Brazil and the entrepreneurs of Brazil, I should say. Thank you so much. Great pleasure talking to you, too.